Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We have a great panel on actionable cash flow management strategies and pro bono resources to help companies navigate these unprecedented times. My name is Allie Watkins, and I'm a reporter for BizWest. BizWest provides breaking business news and economic analysis for Boulder, Broomfield, Larimer, and Well counties, plus Brighton and Westminster, serving a population base of more than 1 million people. We proudly partner with Prairie Mountain Media, contributing to its business coverage. Though BizWest is a subscription-based outlet, all news covering the COVID-19 pandemic and response is provided free to the public. This includes a new series called The Virus Diary that profiles the businesses and people impacted by this crisis, as well as a recently launched podcast series with new episodes every Friday. Our co-sponsors in today's webinar is MAPR Agency. MAPR is one of the oldest and largest public relations firms in Northern Colorado. Please visit their website at www.mapr.agency to see how they can help your business or nonprofit organization during this critical time. Our panelists are Lou Vischer, founder and CEO of Lou's List, Seth Levine, partner and co-founder at Boulder Based Foundry Group, and Lauren Noble, founder and CEO at Simple Startup in Boulder. Let me introduce them now. Lou is founder and CEO of Lou's List, a professional finance and accounting job board of over 11,000 members in Colorado. It helps businesses find finance and accounting talent by posting 100 to 150 jobs a month. Lou also recently retired from a 25 year CFO career where he was CFO for six different technology-related businesses over that time. Lou has been involved in the Colorado community, serving as president of the boards of both the Denver Chapter of Financial Executives International and the Emergency Family Assistance Association in Boulder. Seth is a partner at Foundry Group, which focuses on making early stage technology investments, participating in select growth rounds, and identifying and supporting the next generation of venture fund managers. Foundry has $2.5 billion under management and more than $414 million of its investments have been in Colorado companies. Seth co-founded Pledge 1%, a global network of over 7,000 companies who have pledged equity, time, and product back to their local communities. He also founded Colorado Entrepreneurial by Nature and is also on the board of Startup Colorado. After a distinguished career as an investment analysis in London, Lauren co-founded Simple Startup with his wife, Verity. Lauren re received his MBA from IE Business School in Madrid and is a QuickBooks Pro Advisor with a certificate in advanced financial modeling from London School of Business and Finance. Simple Startup is a Boulder-based finance and accounting firm specializing in serving CPG, tech, and retail clients all over the US. Simple Startup offers growth-focusing bookkeeping, investor-ready accounting, fractional CFO services, and online startup finance education. We'll have a Q&A during the last part of the webinar, so if you have a question for our panelists today, please submit them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, Lou, Seth, and Lauren for joining us. Allie, thank you. This is Seth, everyone. Um, before I talk about the, uh, the origins of the Financial Assistance Network, I wanted just to offer my thanks to uh, MAPR, who's done a huge amount of work to put this webinar together, uh, as well as to BizWest. Um, and I, I think to also just make a, a, a small pitch for BizWest, I, I think it's really important uh, in general, and in particular in times like this, that we support local media. Um, and BizWest, uh, as others have done, uh, are offering all of their COVID-related uh, um, uh, pieces for free uh, online. Um, so if it's something that is uh, important to you or something that's available to you, I'd really encourage you to, uh, to visit BizWest and, and to subscribe, because really it's, it's how they are able to provide uh, platforms such as this webinar. Um, the Financial Assistance Network came uh, about from a, a phone call that I had with Lou Vischer. Uh, Lou reached out to me a couple weeks ago and asked, uh, 
how could how could he be helpful? Um, and as we were on the call, it, it occurred to us that uh, Foundry, my venture firm, has been spending uh, hundreds of hours uh, working with our portfolio companies on uh, various things that they could do to uh, help uh, mitigate the impact of the COVID. 19 financial crisis. Um, and in particular, we've spent um, hundreds and hundreds of hours working on uh, understanding the various federal aid programs that are available from uh, the PPP loans that we'll talk about to Main Street Lending Program and others. Um, and as we were talking about this, it, it occurred to us that, that um, not every business was a part of a network. Uh, that had the, the kind of backing that Foundry was able to provide. Um, and we felt like it was important to, uh, to offer those businesses the chance to, uh, to learn and, and participate from people that were spending much more time than they were able to, um, understanding what, what the current environment meant and, and uh, how to best prepare their businesses. Um, and from that, uh, we decided to, to kick off something that we call the Financial Assistance Network. Uh, Lou sent a note out to, uh, to his list of financial professionals asking for people that would be willing to volunteer for free uh, to help smaller businesses in Colorado and beyond, for profit and nonprofit, uh, work with, uh, with each of their businesses to figure out how to best prepare for the, the current economic environment. Um, we immediately got a great response from Lou's list and, and uh, about uh, less than two days after, uh, about about 36 hours after Lou and I spoke, we officially launched the network. You can access the network at financeassistancenetwork.com. Um, and already we have uh, we have actually helped over this. This is new information from the slide. We've helped over 100 companies uh, work with a financial advisor to help figure out. Um, how to mitigate the impacts of the current crisis. Um, this network is open to to everyone and, and all, and so I would encourage you to please uh, take advantage of it. With that, I will pass it over to Lou and Lauren. Fantastic, Seth. Um, that's wonderful. And um, thank you for the introduction to FAN. It's a fantastic offering, and I highly encourage those that can help um, to apply and those that need help to, to ask. So this whole webinar is about cash flow and finding ways to extend it during this economic crisis. There, these are unprecedented times and it calls for unprecedented measures to make informed decisions, extend your runway and protect your business. So how do you extend your runway? Well, much like measuring your stomach at the start of an exercise and weight loss program, you need to take stock of the status quo. In other words, you need to know how much cash you have in your business right now. Then you need to understand if you are maintaining cash, accumulating cash, or perhaps burning cash. Now I'm guessing that the majority, if not all of you who are here on this webinar, is because you're in the latter position. In other words, you're forecasting to be burning cash. So assuming so, let's first take stock. In order to understand your runway, the first thing you need to know is your cash balance. If you don't know this already, simply log into all of your online banking systems uh, for your business, that is, not for your personal accounts, and total up all of those balances. Having an understanding of your cash balance is the one thing, but it's not going to tell you how long your business can survive with this amount of cash. In order to do this, we need to understand how much cash that you are burning. And there are two ways to kind of look at your cash burn. One is on a gross burn basis, and the other is on a net burn basis. Let me quickly explain the difference between the two. Gross burn looks at all of your cash outflows, and it doesn't include any inflows, usually over an average month. It is totally intentional to not include inflows in gross burn, as the purpose here is to understand how much cash outflow there is, assuming no sales in your company. You may call this a doomsday scenario planning, for example. Net burn, on the other hand, is simply looking at your true cash flow, both cash coming in and cash leaving. As with gross burn, net burn is usually calculated over an average month. Please note that for both gross burn and net burn, some months of cash inflows and outflows may be higher and some months lower. So I'd advise taking an average of the last three months in order to paint a more accurate picture of reality. 
So calculating your runway is relatively simple. You take the current cash position and divide it by your gross or net burn. Divide it by the gross burn to help you paint your doomsday scenario and help you gain some clarity and hence focus, i.e. is that uh, what, what, what basically happens if zero money comes in the door. And then divide it by the net burn to help provide a more accurate position as you will inevitably still be making some sales. Okay, so nothing beats an example. So let's give you one. Let's take a food company. Let's call it nuts about us. And let's assume that food company has $50,000 in the bank as of today. Their cash outflows and hence gross burn are $25,000 per month. And therefore on a gross burn basis, they have two months of runway. Their cash inflows have been $15,000 per month, leaving a cash shortfall of about $10,000. The difference between $15,000 of income and $25,000 of expenses. This is their company's net burn. On a net burn basis, i.e. a more accurate picture of reality, the company has five months of runway, $50,000 divided by $10,000 net burn. Now you may have noticed that what we have done here is to look at historical information to project our runway. And you'd be correct to assume that this is somewhat flawed. What do I mean by this? Well, what happens if the past is now not a good indicator of the future? So well done for thinking about this and hang tight. We'll be specifically addressing our recommendations on how to extend your runway later in this webinar by looking at forecasted cash inflows and forecasted cash outflows. So more to follow on that. I'd like to hand over to Lou, who's going to talk about some resources to help your business survive and extend the runway. Over to you, Lou. Hey, thanks, Lauren. Um, you know, as Seth mentioned, we started this based on a 30-minute catch-up call um, a couple of weeks ago, and a lot's changed in our country and, um, and with the Finance Account, um, Assistance Network. So, you know, we believe we're helping companies in our community survive, and we're sharing this with you today so that if you and your company need help or you know someone that might, uh, you realize that these resources are available. Um, before I jump in though here, I wanted to echo Seth's thanks to both BizWest and MAPR, but also thanks to Seth for his, he has a, a vision here, his leadership here, and his swiftness with which he helped us form this network. And, um, you know, it's interesting, we're getting known as the fan, and I hear there's a radio station in Denver that might, uh, maybe we could get on that. They don't have a lot of sports they're watching or commenting, so maybe, maybe we can get a, a slot there. I, I'm not sure. So, um, hey, let's uh, review a, a few brief resources uh, available to many companies to help them potentially survive and extend their runway. So um, here in front of you, you see the CARES Act. And most of you have probably heard a lot about, or at least some about the CARES Act given all the data that's out there by a lot of experts, consultants, trade organizations, and the like. We're not gonna spend a ton of time here, but I think it's important to highlight a couple of the programs included in this CARES Act because they can potentially have the biggest beneficial impact to your business. And these two are the Paycheck Protection Program and the Emergency Injury Disaster Relief Loan Packages. So why you know, is this $2 trillion and what I believe going up, CARES Act, why is it so massive and this, the largest stimulus package the government's ever done? Well, I believe the government and the leaders in our country have at least learned from the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis that the number one issue with recovery in the time of crisis was the 10 years it took to get our unemployment levels back to something that was acceptable. So this CARES Act is focused almost exclusively on keeping and getting employees working. So we'll review these two programs quickly uh, to see if they can help you. But um, before you, I do that, I'm gonna mention just a couple of other resources. Um, just recently, the state of Colorado announced the Colorado um, State Work Share Program. Um, so if you can apply for that, you can be awarded relief if you have reduced employee hours. Um, and have kept people with reduced hours on staff. 
Uh, we're just learning a little bit more about that one. I think there's also the Main Street programs, which we're learning more and more about, which may be applicable to you. Um, but unemployment's another one. Unemployment's a category that you can use as a resource. Frankly, it's kind of confusing between the time you can get some stimulus help and loans, and it's, uh, it's taking folks longer than they anticipated, and therefore they can't afford to keep their employees on, so they may have to lay people off. Um, so the government's included an additional $600 a week that can help your employees during that interim time frame. And maybe if you get your loans, which we'll talk about again in a minute, uh, you can rehire them back, but you may have to use unemployment. And I've mentioned that unemployment is also available to the independent contractor and 1099 employees now, which in the past it has not been. So you can apply through the, through the state for those. Um, the, the FAN is also here to help you, but we've also been kind of uh, accumulating various banks and financing sources that might be applicable to certain of your businesses. Um, and then last, we're gonna have some ideas here for you, particularly related to cash flow um, and how to look at your business and maybe ways to help you cut some of these expenses. So let's just touch briefly on the, um, uh, the paycheck protection or what they call now PPP or triple P. Um, uh, I'm spending a little time on these only because Again, I think they could be the biggest and most beneficial to you. And because that if done right, and it helps you, if particularly here with the PPP loans, uh, it could be free money to you. So uh, out of the $2 trillion, the uh, $350 billion was allocated to the Paycheck Protection Program. As of yesterday, all the news came was that's sold out, that it's effectively been tapped out. Um, so. Uh, folks are panicking a little bit and trying to figure out where their applications are in the process. We at the FAN are encouraging you to continue to apply for these, to continue to um, get your applications in, and you need to go through a bank to do these. So we encourage you to get with your banker, figure out what they need from you, uh, and then either get the information yourself or ask for the FAN for help to figure out how to get that application in there. Um, we anticipate that the federal government will uh, uh, get together and put out another $250 billion towards this. At least that's what's been rumored. However, no one really knows for sure, but we do believe that they, they will do that. So with this lo uh, loan, much of which will be forgivable, and I'll talk about that, uh, you can get up to $10 million. You must have fewer than 500 employees. Generally, it's one month gross payroll times 2.5. So for example, if you have a $50,000 a month payroll and you've adjusted that down for um, anybody that makes over $100,000 and that, that $50,000, you can apply for a loan for $125,000. Um, once you get that money into your account, you then will have eight weeks to spend that 75% of those monies on payroll, but 25% can be spent on other. How you compute these on cash versus accrual versus the exact time frame and how you measure that's gonna get very complicated. We're seeing the, the government's coming out with some calculators for that and your banks are gonna be the ones responsible for approving that. But again, the FAN can help you set that up and walk you through. Maybe we're, we're actually exploring putting together a template ourselves to help share with you. So if at the end of that eight weeks, you have a balance left of the money you received, that will be converted to a loan, which will be over two years at 1% interest. Mm -hmm. um, the program ends June 30. Again, assuming that more, more funds are available, you can hire your folks back. And as an employer, you only count employees. You do not count 1099 or independent contractors. They must apply for this loan themselves. All right, so another CARES Act program, which is acronymed IDL, um, the Emergency Injury Disaster Loan, um, similar to the PPP in some ways, but this is a true loan. There's no real forgiveness of it or, or free money portion of this. But if you need a loan to extend your runway and assuming funds remain available for this, this could be, again, a, a pretty easy and uh, ex less expensive financing source available to you depending on your circumstances. 
So um, up to $2 million you can apply for, although we're currently hearing rumors that there's some cap at even small amounts like $15,000. Again, we're trying to validate those. Um, you file this one directly with the SBA online. You do not have to go through your bank to do this one. This is a direct application online. You, if you apply for the PPP, you can apply for this EIDL loan as well. You just have to use uh, the funds for different purposes. So you can use the EIDL loan for operating purposes if you like. Uh, they mentioned about a two to three week turnaround. We're seeing more like three to four. Uh, no collateral required for loans up to 25,000. No personal guarantees up to $200,000. This loan can be approved to say based on your, your, your company's credit score. Uh, solely on that. It's a 30 year term, like I said, and um, at 3.75 for up to 30 year terms, terms, if you're approved for that, that's a pretty good deal. And no payments for the, for the first year. So now before um, Lauren gets into some details and ideas for you to think about as you explore ways to decrease your burn rate and extend your runway, I wanted to share with you just a little bit more about the Financial Assistance Network, um, the resources we have available in and around the FAN and how we're helping companies. So uh, currently we have over 50, it's actually closer to 75, like that first slide said, of senior finance professionals who are ready to help. We have expert advisory firms, like we have uh, two law firms and accounting firm ready to consult to our volunteers. We have HR experts ready to help you. For example, if you have FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, or PTO questions and, um, the like we can help there. We have coaching resources available, whether it's an individual coach or company coaches. We can immediately get in and triage what's going on with you and, and be a listening um, person for you and or help really digging in, rolling up our sleeves and, and getting into your business to try to help you. Um, we are very uh, familiar with and because, as we've talked about with PPP and IDLE, so we're very helpful there. One of the bigger issues, as I mentioned, is you have to get with your bank on PPP and we're starting to find local community banks that are willing to take applicants that are not bank customers. And because uh, we're finding a lot of banks aren't even taking some of these loans and or they're getting tapped out. Uh, we can help you with forecasting and modeling and, and Lauren's gonna talk about that. We can do scenario planning. We have some tax planning and strategy services available. Financing sources, I mentioned that before, we're starting to look at uh, not only banks, but some alternative sources in the event you have, uh, have needs there that can maybe fit. But um, we're also got different tips and tricks to help you reduce expenses, defer some of your expenses, increase revenue. And the, the nice thing about all this for you, uh, particularly in a time of crisis like this, is this is entirely pro bono. Um, so we're going to do this all for free. Hopefully, hopefully not too long, but we, we're going to do it for now for free. So, uh, so at the end of, of the um, presentation and likely on the BizWest websites, there's going to be links to the uh, FAN webpage where you can log your information and ask for help. And so within 24 to 48 hours, we're going to be in touch with you and assigning you to volunteers so, you, so they can dig in with you on bringing these resources um, and try to help. So thanks for listening and I'm going to turn this over to Lauren. Great. Thank you very much, Lou. Um, uh, wonderful. I put my headset on so hopefully people can hear me a little bit easier now. Okay, so uh, just quickly, there's going to be a lot of information being covered in these slides. I just want to make sure that everyone, you will be getting um, a recording of this. It will be available for download. So don't worry if you're not capturing everything, you will be able to listen to it again. So um, as, a remind, uh, as a member of FAN, one of the pro bono resources that Simple Startup has created is a special COVID-19 focused cash management course. There has never been a more critical time for companies to understand and be more effective with their cash flow management. So we redesigned our popular cash manager program and have made it available to every business. Uh, right now, for free as part of this fan offering. The first thing any business needs to do is to immediately understand its cash flow position. With that information, business owners and nonprofit leaders can begin working out how to make the most of PPP funds, 
loans, tax credits, etc., to keep your business up and running through COVID. This is why we're making our Cash Manager course available for free today to help companies uh, understand their position and give access to the tools that you can use going forward. So we use an easy to follow video format as well as a downloadable cash manager that will enable every company to quickly find its current cash position and then test out different ways to make the most of the scarce dollars that are available. For example, how will you extend your runway? If you ask your team to go on half salaries, for instance, or how will you best use your PPP funds to set up a revised payment plan with your vendors, for instance? This is where the cash manager can help because it's at a touch of a button, you'll know exactly how long your runway is. And again, no matter how, how much financial knowledge you have, each company will also have an incredible foundation to make the most of the pro bono services that FAN is offering. You can then go to your FAN advisor with this cash tool and, and with clear information about where you're at right now and how long your runway is, making your work with your FAN advisor even more productive and efficient. So your fan advisor can then focus on helping you with higher level financial strategy to extend that runway. Think of it like a building block that will help make your skyscraper taller and also more stable. You can get access to this course using the links in the final resources slide, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so um, extending your runway. The first most important thing about extending your runway is uh, to be keeping your customers, okay? So we talked a lot about taking stock of your current position and a little about how you can use the pro bono cash manager to protect your runway based on what we think is going to happen with cash in inflows and outflows over the next 90 days. What we're gonna talk about now is our tips and tricks to ensure you're able to extend your runway as far as possible. The first up here is to keep your customers. Okay, so you've got me. This is a very straightforward suggestion, but it's often within the simple things that we find the most value. Now is the time to, to truly care for your customers. Deliver everything you can to them. Go above and beyond. Remember why you started your business in the first place, and if necessary, use it as an opportunity to reinvent yourself, your business model, and perhaps even your pricing structure. It's also possible you can now prioritize certain customer initiatives and get team buy-in from them. So what are you likely experiencing with your customers? My guess is that right now at worst, you're losing customers as they cut costs. And at best, you are being put under significant pressure to reduce the cost of your products or services to them. You are therefore likely to be finding yourself in a negotiation and one that you're probably not appreciating. The first thing to remember is that negotiations can be fun, I promise. Sit back and relax. The negotiation is gonna happen regardless of your state of mind, so start taking a deep breath. My advice is to create customers, but also ensure that you maintain and hence protect your own margins. Don't simply accept demands for discounts, bend over and be done with it. At Simple Startup, we have a core value, which is, to treat your customers and ourselves like rock stars because we are. Now, don't forget that a great negotiation ends with win-wins. So if you're on the receiving end of a customer trying to reduce their costs, then here are three examples of how you can create a win-win and hence continue treating your customers and yourselves like rock stars. So number one, you could provide a discount to help your customers with their cash flow, but in return, sign your, sign your customer up for a longer term contract. Number two, you could provide a discount again to help your customers with cash flow, but in return, offer that discount perhaps as a 0% loan, where they're obligated to return the loan balance to you at a predefined later date. Or number three, you could provide a discount again to help save them with cash in return, deliver or scale back on your services or deliver a sort of lower quality product that still meets their needs. Obviously, you'd be clear and upfront about all of this and have a written agreement. Now, what I'm trying to labor here is that finding mutual ground where both you and your customer are happy with the outcome. Now, remember, to, if you don't respect yourself and go into this as an enjoyable activity, you'll, un, you'll undoubtedly have a kind of worse result. So remember, respect yourself and go into this as an enjoyable activity. And the final point on this one, the silver lining, is that this is a great opportunity to further learn who your ideal customers are. You can then become more focused 
with your company's messaging. So our next slide is increasing cash in. And specifically, we're going to start with talking about accounts receivable. This is the first area that we're going to talk about. Now, depending on your business model, you'll likely have accounts receivable balance as of, as of today, i.e. the amount of money that your customers still owe you. And hopefully not too many of these are aging. In other words, they're past their due date. Regardless, you need to know or you need to be collecting on these customers' invoices. And I highly advise assigning a risk rating to the customer. Which of your invoices and hence customers will cause greatest risk to your business? A simple low, medium, or high will suffice. This helps you prioritize your list. Once you've done this, I would assign a specific person in your team to be liaising with these customers. Now, this could be either you as a business owner or your accounting department, or perhaps even an account executive that made the sale in the first place that can find an angle that you or your accounts team are not seeing. In addition, you could decide to reduce the terms you offer your customers and hence collect on cash faster, or even start doing credit checks on new companies to decide whether or not you want to give them any terms at all. You may even decide to, not, to, to, to only take advance payments from customers. Everything and anything is on the, on, the, on the table here and possible. So alternatively, you could make a decision to factor these invoices. Now, what do I mean by factoring? Factoring is the process of selling your invoices to a third party so that they can generate more cash flow to yourself and faster. You can do some very quick Googling and you'll find a multitude of different factoring companies. Now, finally, and always as a last resort, if you feel like your customer is not open to talking and you are therefore finding it challenging to come to an agreement, a collection agency may be a necessary step. So the next area that we're going to talk about here is financing opportunities. Clearly, leverage on the existing financial relationships that you have. Can you fully draw down on your line of credit? Perhaps you can extend this line of credit further with your bank. Have you already applied for the PPP loans that Lou was talking about? Are you successful in having funds allocated? And have you considered potentially even using your assets as collateral to secure financing and hence receive cash? This could be a, a financing a piece of equipment that you own outright, or perhaps a form of inventory financing if you hold inventory. The next area, and likely the last resort, is that you can sell your assets to release cash. You could either sell off inventory at a great price to release short-term cash, but again, be careful that this doesn't cripple your inventory reserves and hence squash your margins. The last port of call, um, is that you could sell a piece of equipment and change your business model to be more outsourced. While this will likely have an impact on your margins, you will be releasing some capital. Okay, so, so other creative ideas. Now, this list of other creative ideas is only limited to your imagination. Here are a couple that I came up with. One is to team up with other organizations that you are familiar with and create buying operatives to bring down the cost of your supplies. Uh, other things could be just lease everything, don't buy anything, computers, software, fixtures, fittings, furniture. Turn all of your annual payments into monthly. Now, it may cost you slightly more in the, in, in the long run, but it will reduce big lumps of cash out. Okay, so let's move on to uh, our next slide and talking about decreasing cash out. So the first and most significant cash out in any business is its staffing. There are many ways that you can look at your staff. Obvious initiatives to consider are pay cuts. You know, typically, the more senior the staff, the greater the cut. You could also look at reducing hours. Now, you could put the staff from salaried to wage-based to give you a little bit more payroll flexibility. You could also furlough staff. What is furloughing? It's basically temporary layoffs from work and give staff the opportunity to claim unemployment. In general, people are not paid during these furloughs, but they do keep employment benefits, you know, such as their health insurance. Furloughs are, however, mandatory, so please note that workers are ordered not to do anything work-related while they are on furlough. So PPP that Lou is talking about, loan forgiveness on payroll, you know, Lou talked about this, and I fully agree that you should continue to apply and get in the queue, regardless of what you hear about the current SBA allocations being met. So the one thing to think really carefully about when you take action for staffing, and don't forget how long it takes you to grow these employees in your firm. 
Therefore, when making changes or staff, be really careful to trim the flesh, but I personally avoid cutting into the bone of your organization because you run the risk of literally handicapping yourself and the company when we all start to recover. So the second here is to carefully manage your outstanding accounts payable. Similar to accounts receivable, write down a list of what you owe other people and when. Now this could just be a simple export from your accounting system. Rank them in order of importance, again, with the biggest bills and most important relationships first, and get them on the phone, to get onto the phone to these people, right? They will appreciate that. Can you extend your runway um, and uh, can you extend your runway with these vendors, you know, and agree to a payment plan with them? Can they change their terms with you so that you no longer have to pay so quickly? Now, I would also say here is vendors have their own businesses. Now, don't be a chump and just not pay your bills. If for no other reason, then you may end up burning bridges with people that you need in the future. People will remember how you behaved in this crisis. And if it wasn't pretty, uh, that will potentially damage relationships long term. So again, like your customers, concentrate on finding win-wins. The third example here is to capitalize on your credit cards. You'll likely have a credit card and likely have access to credit with your credit card provider. What I want to be really clear on here is that credit card interest rates are incredibly high. So be really careful with this option. What you therefore ought to do, especially if you have a large balance sitting on your credit card and you are being charged interest, is to simply apply for a credit card with 0% financing until next year. Now, there are many of these available. A quick 30 seconds of Googling and you'll find a list of the best 0% credit cards in April alone. So make sure that you find one that has a 0% on balance transfers so that you can move existing credit across to your new credit card. Many of these credit card providers will give you a 0% lifeline, 0% capital that's cheaper than the PPP for 12 to 18 months, depending on that provider. So the fourth is to negotiate your rent. This comes back to the age old saying of, if you don't ask, you don't get. Like nothing is off the table in this current environment. Your landlord would appreciate a telephone call and your success is also in their interest too. Voids are very costly to landlords and they would like to keep your custom. So offering to pay a reduced rent by committing to a longer contract is just another example of a win-win for both of you. So the fifth here is to renegotiate uh, with um, your insurance providers. The obvious way to save cash is just to cancel your insurance policies. However, again, word of caution here, now may be the most important time to have coverage, especially for directors and officers of your company, as every man and his dog will be looking for cash themselves. Insurance could therefore be your best friend this year. Fear not, though, there are specific ways that you can decrease your cash out without canceling your insurance policies. Number one, you could reduce coverage. It doesn't make sense to pay for something that you're not receiving right now. There is an opportunity right now to lower your premiums rather than waiting for your policy to expire. So many companies are experiencing and expecting a significant decrease in revenue and or staff this year, and therefore you don't have the same coverage. So don't, again, wait for your policy to expire to provide updated information to your insurance carriers. There are hundreds, if not thousands of dollars sitting on the table here. The second option here is payment plans. You could talk to your broker and your insurance carrier about setting up a payment plan instead of paying quarterly or annually up front and negotiate uh, the charges for doing so. Perhaps also even defer your insurance payment for a month or two. Now I've seen examples of insurance carriers helping on both of these cases. The third and final thing here, which most people probably don't know much about, is premium financing. This is not applied uh, to everyone, and it's not every policy, but some brokers have financed insurance policies in order for them to receive payment up front and the insurance company to be paid over the year. Now, policyholders are often not aware of this, so always read the small print, and the broker is making some additional margin in the deal. So this may equate to 11 to 13 percent approximately of your policy premium that could in theory be in your back pocket, not in theirs. So again, speak to your brokers and your insurance companies. So the sixth and final um, piece here is payroll taxes. Now the CARES Act did a lot of things and under the CARES Act here, there is the ability to defer employ the employer portion of your payroll taxes during the deferred period, which is the 27th of March um, to the 31st of April. Now the amount 
the amount uh, to the the amount is the 6.2 percent of the employer portion of the, of the social security tax that can be paid in two installments so you can pay this in two installments half of the deferred amount must be paid by the 31st of december 2021 and the remaining half must be paid by the 31st of december 2022 so again it's helping with some short-term cash flow challenges so it's available to all employers regardless of your impact to your business from the coronavirus but please note, as with anything, there's always some small print and exceptions, one of which is that you cannot claim forgiveness on your PPP in that eight weeks following the loan period and also defer that payroll component of your payroll tax. So again, I recommend talking to your accountant or payroll provider for more information on this. So the seventh and final here is discretionary expenses. So um, the obvious piece here is to avoid all discretionary spending. My advice is to pull the last three months of your bank and credit card statements and do a review of all of the recurring expenses. Look at your subscriptions, CRMs, email providers, etc. Is there anything that you don't need? If so, cancel it. So before we jump into the next slide, I know that Lou has a couple of additional comments that he wanted to add on things like payroll, rent, and deferred taxes. So over to you, Lou, to add a couple of pieces. Yeah, just qu quickly. I, I think this all kind of gives maybe you a, a flavor for what a, you know, a senior finance accounting executive can bring to the table with, for you as you, if you need help like this by engaging a fan member. Lauren's kind of given you a ton of examples, a ton of ideas to look for, and, and our team's ready to do that within your business if you, if you need that kind of help. Um, for example, you know, we, ha we also have on the rent side, we have tenant rep brokers uh, available on our, uh, at FAN to, to dig in and help you uh, analyze your contract and, and talk to your landlord with you, give you some advice. They're in the middle of this every day. Similarly, we have insurance folks that are experts in this stuff that, that we can leverage. Um, just a couple quick comments on on the, the staffing side. One, I would encourage, and we are encouraging this as our, our fan volunteers, that when you do make pay cuts, let's make sure that the pay cuts start at the top, right? That make sure that they, it's not you're just cutting your staff and your medium, middle level staff, but that the executives are taking, taking pay cuts as well. Um, Lauren mentioned furloughs. Uh, we do have some, some HR experts on staff at FAN that can also help you through that. It gets a little tricky to do that, but also, in the event that some of your people have to be laid off, we also have uh, been going through some employee uh, insurance benefits and can help at least point you in the right direction to the uh, state exchanges and some insurance brokers on a personal level there. So if some of your employees need the help getting pointed in the right direction, we can do that. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to, to Lauren here to wrap this up and then I think we're gonna be ready for some questions. Great, thank you very much, Lou. Um, so the next slide is really, how do you know when you have hit the right balance? How do you know when you've done, a, uh, done enough here? That's a great question. And it, sometimes, it somewhat depends on the stage of your company, the industry that you're in, and whether you are VC-backed growth style company or not. So as an absolute minimum, I'd want to make sure that all of you have enough cash to take you to the end of the year at least. If you are a growth-backed company, um, a, a growth back VC company, I want to make sure that you have enough cash for at least 18 or uh, 18 months of runway and ideally 24 months of runway. So keep playing with all of these ideas. Use the tools that we have available to you. Talk to the fan network. Get creative and ensure that you have cash to not only survive the crisis, but also thrive when, not if, we come out the other side. So thank you everyone for listening. Lou, Seth, and I would now love to take any questions that you may have. Thank you for those presentations. Um, here on the next slide, uh, we'll have some links available, uh, both to Fan Simple Startup and some more information on PPP. So our first question today is from Mark. He asks, um, if we have employees who have filed for unemployment due to COVID-19, how soon do they need to come off of it after we have received the PPP? Um, so, Lou, do you want to go ahead and take this question? Sure. Um, once you get your PPP funds, you have eight weeks to spend those funds. Um, you can you can expend it longer, but within the first eight weeks, 
That's the part that the, your bank will get with you and find out how much you spent on payroll and other operating expenses. And that part will be forgivable. Um, you will not have to pay that back. So we're encouraging people that as soon as they get those funds, hire those people back and start paying them under with your PPP loan money. So as soon as possible or practical, as you get your PPP money is when I would get those people off unemployment and onto your payroll. Um, there's another question here uh, that's regarding um, retaining workers. Uh, so this business owner has only part-time hourly employees um, and they have a three-part question. They're asking, well, I need to pay for forgiveness. Um, how does the part-time to full-time aggregate of employees work is measured? And if I determine that a person will get $10,000 total in the next eight weeks, can I say to them, this will be for four months of work and $250,000, um, sorry, $2,500 a month to get someone through April, May, June, and July as their business will not come back in only eight weeks. Um, so I'll go ahead and just open up this question about part-time employees uh, to whoever would like to answer. Lauren, are you, I, I mean, I, I can try to take that. Again, the, yep. the, the whole intent uh, around the PPP is to try, to, if, if you have to, effectively lay people off, pay them what they were making prior to that. Um, and so if they were part-time back then, that's how you're gonna compute what you're going to try to get from the government. And that's what you would pay them post uh, receiving. Um, there's gonna be a look back period as well to look back to a period a year ago Obviously, the world's changed, um, it, and a lot of businesses aren't the same they were to are today that they were a year ago. So, keep in mind, and I know these are pretty detailed questions to answer on a webinar. I, I'm going to try to answer it in general terms, which is the the goal is to try to pay your employees, whether part time or full time, what they were getting paid before. That's how you should apply for the funds that you get, and that's how you should apply the funds that you get to those employees and pay them. Um, Seth, uh, there's a question here. Um, uh, this person um, uh, applied for PPP, um, and they'd like to start paying their employees as soon as possible. However, their rented facility their ability to offer them work. Uh, what do you suggest for this person? Allie, you broke up in the middle of that question. Would you mind repeating it? Um, yeah, so I have a question here from Steve, which says, what happens if we get a PPP loan and start paying employees? However, our facility, they rent space, is closed limiting our effectiveness. And what is he specifically looking for? Is it is the question, Steve, whether you can whether you could still seek forgiveness under the PPP? As long as you as long as you're spending 75% of the money that you were for this eight week period, um, then you can get forgiveness. If the, I think the question sounds like it's, but what if what if they can't actually work? Um, the PPP doesn't specifically address that, as Lou just said. It's really designed for. Uh, to get money in the hands of employers so that they can then give that money uh, or pay, use that money to pay employees. Um, and so it's not specific to um, their physically showing up at work. It's, it's keeping them on your payroll uh, that triggers the forgiveness portion of the PPP loan. Obviously, as a business owner, you'll want to consider how you can get productivity out of workers that are on your payroll. So you'll have to, depending on the type of business, you'll have to try to figure out if there's a way around that or if there are other facilities that you're able to utilize. Um, so we have a question from Chris. He asks, we applied for IDLE. Do you have tips for how to check the status? Um, and Lauren, do you want to take this? Yes. I mean, whoop, 
Yes, I can quickly take that. Um, I, I, I'm going to have to actually deflect that question because I, I don't exactly know the, the, how to check the status of that one. So I may deflect to, to either Seth or Lou if you do know of how to um, check the status. Yeah, the only way to check is to continue to go to the SBA. I mean, obviously getting anybody on the phone at the SBA is probably going to be next to impossible. Um, but I would continue to check your email and however they were going to reach out to you. Um, they're potentially, I haven't physically checked myself either. And so there, there potentially is something on the SBA website that says check status. I don't, I really don't know, but um, the, the only way is to go through the SBA. I would say in general, it's been hard to, to check status, right? We have a lot of companies with PPP loans that are in, in determined status. Uh, on the PPP side, people have been checking with the banks that they're, that they're going through. Um, I have heard a uh, it's not exactly a hack, but for those of you who either speak Spanish or have access to someone who does, I've been told that the Spanish language uh, dial-in number for the SBA has significantly shorter wait times. Um, and so I know some people that have actually been using that to try to, um, to, try to get their questions answered more quickly. All right, uh, this um, question is for anyone. It's a question from Kay, um, which asks, with PPP, Will these monies be counted as income and subject to state and federal taxes? Yeah, I'm happy to start with answering that question. So the question was, is this, is this captured as income? Sorry, that was the first part of the question. This, yes. The PPP is a loan. So it's not income in your business. It's not sitting on your income statement. It's a loan, it's a liability that will sit on your balance sheet. And so uh, depending on what happens in this eight week period following the, the receipt of that loan, and we've talked before about using that for 75% of which is payroll related costs and other things could be utility or rent. So uh, the, the forgiveness will happen shortly after that eight week period. You'll, be, you'll, you'll need to provide all sorts of documentation to your lender to, pr to prove the forgiveness. And so depending on how much you loan, let's say it's $100,000, for easy numbers, uh, and you have uh, approximately $75,000 worth of payroll costs over that period of time, then clearly you can claim all of that payroll cost as forgiveness. And additionally, that 25% could go towards rent. You could fully forgive um, all of that on your loan. For the, for the purpose of your, your, your accounting, it sits on your balance sheet as a liability. And over the course of the next few months, you could clearly reduce that liability, assuming that you get forgiveness. Yeah, yeah normally, if you have a loan with a bank and they forgive it, you're going to get a document that says this is taxable to you. Um, I can't remember the number of the form. It's kind of like a 1099 kind of thing. But uh, you're not going to get that for the forgivable portion of this. Um, is my understanding. So it will not be taxable to you. Um. Um, and then we have a couple of questions asking if sole proprietors or contractors are eligible for PPP. Yes, they are. And they must apply individually um, or through their, their business as an independent contractor. So you get, if start with going to your bank Find out who your banker is and see if they're going to accept PPP applications. But you, yes, you have to do it uh, on behalf of, of yourself or your company as an independent contractor. But they are eligible. Um, we have a question from Nancy um, asking, could you please address the employee retention tax credit as an alternative to the PPP? I have to admit, I am not versed enough in that one to to answer. That might be another one I could sure get some of our fan resources to answer, but I, I'm not up to speed on that one. I have to admit. Well, well, I'm not an expert in that that specific in the specifics of what uh, of that program. We've run some modeling on it, and I've seen the results of that. and And the results have generally been that the tax credit is worth about half of what you would qualify for. Uh, with a PPP loan. Um, so for certain types of businesses, it may be, may be better to, uh, to go, up, go for the tax credit, um, particularly if you've kept 
kept people employed through this and or uh, you've missed out on the, the PPP loan. Um, and again, you can do you can do both, but you you can't apply them both if that makes sense. You can you can pursue both, but then you 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 won't be able to take credit for the uh, either the PPP forgiveness or the tax credit. One of them ends up getting reversed if you end up getting the PPP loan and it gets forgiven. But about fifty, the heuristic that we've been using with our companies having modeled it out for a handful of businesses now is that it's worth about fifty percent uh, on a cash on cash basis of what the PPP loan would be worth. All right, um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, here's one um, asking if venture capitals are still investing or if uh, this person should put their small raise on hold. Uh, the, the quick answer is that absolutely VCs are still, uh, still investing. Um, and in, in fact, anyone who's been in venture for any period of time, certainly through the last downturn, will know that uh, statistically speaking, uh, investing in and through downturns is a, is a great time to be an investor. And, and frankly, it's a great time to either start or grow a business. So I think that hasn't changed. Certainly, there's specific types of businesses that are struggling more to raise money. Um, and depending on who you're raising money from, uh, my anecdotal sense is that uh, angel investors, so private individuals that, are, that invest in very early stage companies, um, have pulled back and, and are, uh, are not investing as rapidly at the moment. Um, I think possibly because they lost a bunch of money in the market crash and where they're trying to just get their hands around uh, sort of the, the effects of this, this market crisis. Um, but it, most institutional investors that I know, even if they've slowed down a little bit because they have portfolio companies that they need to work with and, and help through this, um, are continuing to invest through the crisis. And the good news, ultimately, at least on that front, is that um, a lot of firms raise money in the last couple of years. And there's a lot of what we in the industry call dry powder, basically money that has been committed to funds but, but has not uh, been invested into companies, uh, there's a lot of dry powder sitting on the sidelines. So that, that, and that will, venture capitalists and, and uh, institutional investors are incented ultimately to invest that money. So it, it will come into the market, even if it's, uh, if it's a little bit slower than it was a few months ago. Um, and uh, this will be the last question uh, for any of our panelists. Um, Mary asks, can you talk again about deferring employer portion of payroll taxes and the dates it is effective? Yeah, so I think that the, 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 going back to that piece just now, I think that the employer portion of the dates, from what I understand, is there is a period of which you can defer that employer tax responsibility. And um, from what I gather, the dates are the 27th of March to the 31st of April. So again, similar to the PPP, trying to find a very short uh, window um, to help assist with kind of cash flow challenges um, at this point in time. So if there's any, any of the other panel want to add to that, um, please, please do. Um, it, and I have a little different take. We can try to confirm this. My understanding is that you can de defer the employer portion of taxes for all of 2020. And then you do not have to pay these back, uh, one half of it back uh, to the government or fund that uh, deferral by December 31st, 2021. And then the other half by December 31st, 2022. 2022. Great. Um, Lou, Lauren, or Seth, uh, do you have anything um, that you'd like to add before we wrap up today? No, I just want to, well, am I? Yeah, I'm not on mute. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone here in the panel, everyone for attending. Um, it's been really great to share as much knowledge as we can, uh, re-emphasizing the fan network here, uh, re-emphasizing kind of providing some, uh, some uh, tools, some cash flow management tools. It's very important to ensure that you know where you are and where you're going to be. So uh, thank you to everyone. And Ali, thank you to you for moderating. And once again, thanks to MAPR and to BizWest for putting this on. I think it's really important in this time that we all um, help each other out. And I think really the origin of, of FAN was, was from that, uh, that sense of, of uh, community and this belief that um, ultimately we can all get through this, but, but to do it, uh, especially given all of the very various confusing information that's out there, uh, to do it, we, just, we simply need to be helpful. Um, so we're trying to be good neighbors and we appreciate uh, MAPR and BizWest, your, your 
uh, living that and helping us uh, get the word out about the network. And of course, Lou and Lauren, thank you guys for your, both your help on the network itself and, and of course this advice that you're giving. It's really helpful. Thank you. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say, Lou? Oh, all good. Thanks for attending. Uh, well, thank you again uh, for everyone who attended this webinar today. Um, I want to again thank our panelists, uh, Lou, Lauren, and Seth, and MAPR. Um, thank you again for tuning in, and I hope that today's webinar um, helped you understand a little bit more about how to navigate these times.